how to survive and thrive in corporate America. That is, has, has always been a very difficult issue that African Americans have faced, especially black women as well. There's only been one black woman who's actually been the head of a Fortune 500 company. That was Ursula Jones at Xerox. So my next author uh, has a book out that deals with that. Uh, it's called No Thanks, Seven Ways to Say I'll Just... Uh, include myself uh, is again new book out by uh, Michelle Smith. Uh, there is tips on how to deal with racism, bias, and microaggression in the workplace. Michelle, certainly glad to have you uh, here. So um, this is an issue that a lot of people are talking about even now. So even in the wake of the George Floyd death, everybody talking about all these DNI positions that are available. We're still seeing. Uh, uh, sisters deal with the kind of bias uh, in corporate America where you have, frankly, largely white men still running the show. Absolutely, Roland. Thanks so much for having me on your show. And you're right. These companies are built with white male at the center. They are centered. They were not built with us in mind. So we can't even begin to think that the kind of change that even some of these companies are trying to make will even begin to solve our problems. It's a long way to go. So what do you do in the meantime? You have to do some self-talk. And there are some sisters who have made it. So I've turned to them and based on my experience in corporate America and as a serial entrepreneur, I offer some tips. Uh, and so well, what's the most important thing that jumps out? Absolutely. The hero or the heroine in the book is knowing your value. And that starts with knowing yourself. So many of us are jumping to trying to be our most authentic selves, but we don't know who we are. And that starts with some very hard self reflection and knowing your story. And it also begins with understanding that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. No matter what you believe, you have to know that your value starts with that. And that means you're entitled. So when you get that together and understand the threads from your past, for me, it's um, a passion for technology, a passion for business and a passion for culture. You can begin to weave together your value and walk tall in your power. That's the first thing. Um, we're also, your sisters also dealing with uh, lack of mentors. I mean, the reality is the higher yes. you grow up in corporate America, it gets thinner and thinner. And it, even now in 2020, there are very few black people who are at the top in many of these companies. Absolutely. And what I've found is there is a gaping hole in the center of the leadership pipeline. And what's spewing out of that hole, women, but especially women of color and black women at a more startling rate. We have women who are pushed out. We have those who have just given up because, you know, a gee whiz, I'm just not going to uh, excel. So I'm starting my own business. The U.S. Census says that black women are starting more businesses than any other group. But here's the thing. You do need your mentors. You need sponsorship, too. And you also need the peers who can be your eyes and ears. I like to say that you need air cover and ground cover. But the problem is that women have heard this. Black women have heard this, but they don't know how to do it. There are steps to it, and you need to activate this tribe. Most of us will assemble these folks, but we won't ever call them. Uh, good point there. Uh, i got uh, my panelists here. I'm going to start with uh, Avis Jones the Weaver. Avis, what's your question from Michelle Smith? Hi, Michelle. How are you? Uh, Hi, Avis. Hi. Glad to see this book. Always important to discuss these issues. I'm interested with your research if uh, you are finding what I've seen myself in terms of a pattern in corporate America to the degree that there seems to be a focus on issues of diversity uh, and issue of women. It tends to almost exclusively be relegated to white women getting all the spoils. Hmm. So I'm, I'm interested in, in your research and your book. Are you finding similarly that the co companies seem to be so much more interested in quote unquote gender diversity uh, than racial diversity, for example. And to the degree that they look at gender diversity, they pretty much only see it in a way that benefits our white counterparts. Absolutely. And you know what? This goes back to the problem with DE&I or diversity, equity and inclusion programs. They try to make one broad sweep, one broad swipe at everyone. And they miss the fact that diversity means that you have your uniqueness. And so when there was this big push just recently to get into gender equality, they didn't think about the intersectionality of women. And that's not just about race. There are all sorts of boxes to be checked. LB, LGBTQIA, there is um, accessibility issues. 
No one wants to dig that deeply. And that's one of the problems with these DEI uh, programs. And then you have companies that try to separate gender equality from racial equality or their other diversity efforts when it came to culture, race, and ethnicity. And you know what? It just won't work like that. Julian Mabo. Julian, what's your question for Michelle? Uh, Michelle, I was wondering about um, the ways that we talk about um, equity in the context of um, political equality. What kind of conversations can we have and can we not have in the workplace? In other words, uh, people are, are often willing to just lump <coughs> women into a, a, a basket. Um, and they expect us all to be able to have the same conversations. How do we have different conversations that empower each other? Well, you know, first of all, we can't just turn to the people who are oppressed for all the answers. It really is a matter of the people who are in charge, the ones who are leading to push themselves to learn more than they already do. And the problem actually lies within the fact that their immediate communities do not consist of different people. And you hit the nail on the head, Ms. Malvo, when you said that we're different. You can't just come at women's issues and think you're going to take a broad brush at everyone. You can't do that. And the fact that these people, these leaders are living in bubbles and they bring their whole selves to work with them. That's what we say, right? They come to work with their experiences. And if their experiences are limited, they're going to act in limited ways and put policies in place that are very limited. And Craig. Uh, so, and I agree with you. You can't, you can't expect the press to like, have all the answers. So I guess my question is, um, how can black men be an ally to black women specifically in this space? Ah, I'm so glad you asked that. That's great. First of all, black men need to understand there is a difference. And I think up until now, that we've been lumped together just as black folks. And I understand it. Many of us have some of the same cultural background, but you know what, just like black folks, period, we are not a monolith. So there are some gender specific issues. We as double outsiders is what Catalyst called us, that we have as women that black men can be on the lookout for. And I always like to say, when you see something, say something, because Black men actually do have this one little thing over us, and that's gender. <laughs> and you can relate with white men in a way, it may be limited, but even a bit more than we can yeah, just on that we're fact limited. alone. <laughs> yeah, it's limited. limited. It's limited. But it is there. It's very nuanced. So if you are in a meeting and you see that a woman, a woman is being mansplained or white-splained, it is up to you to speak up. And the book actually talks about how you need to speak up, even though you might decide that someone may call you angry or hard to work with. You've got to speak up. And the way you can do that is to build your confidence, leaning outside of that organization in order to lean into the organization. And that means you need to have multiple streams of income. You need to have more than one egg in a basket. You need to have other opportunities knocking on your door so that you can go into that situation and speak for the greater good and not fear for your livelihood. Um, also, I think it's important also, uh, at the end of the day, we talk about being a lot real simple. I mean, it's providing opportunities. I mean, the, the reality is, re is recognized. It, it's very easy to, to see when something doesn't make any sense. Uh, and that is, is you know, look, there have been times when, look, I remember what, whether it's this show, I had my TV One show, uh, I would sit there, and actually when my TV One show, I had damn near all female staff, and I'd be sitting and looking at the show going down, and I'm like, uh, I'm not the only one seeing mostly dudes. Yeah. And it was interesting, to, and, 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 and I would go, I'm, and again, and so when you're cognizant of that, because the reality is, when you're black, you're trained to see everybody. You're trained to see, is it mostly men? Is it mostly women? Is it black people, white people, Latinos? Uh, you know what your place is, so it's not actually hard to see it. Somebody's had to be willing to actually say something to spot it. Well, and you know what, Roland? You bring up a great point because there's a chapter in the book that looks at the layers of privilege, and there are all sorts of privileges. There's white privilege, of course. We talk about that. But there are other layers of privilege that allow you to center that. And the thing is that 
we all have to be a part to center someone or some group of people. And the fact is that people of color or even people who are of a different gender or what have you center this power center. So sometimes we are bought in and you will see that there are women who will buy into this paternal white power center and work within that system to disenfranchise people who look like them or even have the same gender. I, I say all skin folk and kin folk and Karen will call the manager on you. <laughs> uh, real damn quick. All right, folks. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the book uh, is uh, again, seven ways is no thanks. Seven ways, uh, I'll, uh, seven ways to say no. I'll just include myself. Uh, it is a guide uh, to rockstar leadership for women of color in the workplace by L. Michelle Smith. Michelle, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. Robert. All right. Thank you so very much. All right, folks. Uh, we're almost done here. Uh, let me do this.